Welcome to the party. I'm Sam Ekstrom of Locked On Sports Minnesota. It's Mailbag Wednesday. Reggie Wilson, Luke Inman, and who the Vikings should take at number 23. Could it be a safety again? That's coming up on the Minnesota Football Party. Locked On Sports Minnesota podcast. It's endless Minnesota Vikings talk with the diverse voices of your local experts. It's time for the Minnesota Football Party. It's your guys hanging out talking next level Vikings football. So join in with Pro Football Network's Arif Hassan, Locked On Vikings Luke Braun, Superior Sports Talk's Luke Inman, and Vikings Insider Sam Ekstrom, plus the biggest names in Minnesota football for the Minnesota Football Party. And it starts now. Hey, 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 it's a Wednesday. It's the Minnesota Football Party on Locked On Sports Minnesota. I'm Sam Ekstrom. I cover the Vikings here at Locked On Sports Minnesota. I'm joined by Reggie Wilson. I'm joined by Luke Inman. Reggie, the sports director at CARE 11. Luke Inman, he's our draft guru here at Locked On Sports Minnesota. He's on Twitter at Luke underscore Spinman. Plenty of draft questions to get to today of our many mailbag questions um before we get to all that today's show is brought to you by FanDuel it's America's number one sports book head to FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started make every moment more with FanDuel uh plenty of ways to find us as well locked on sports Minnesota on YouTube free uh beautiful video that you can get every single day you can also find us wherever you listen to podcasts um Luke Inman how are you doing today 22 days 22 days. We're almost there, boys. Christmas morning can't come <laughs> soon enough. <laughs> I'm Reggie, can't, you- Reggie can't wait. Reggie loves these. As much as Reggie loves these mock drafts, mock draft season, he texts me all the time, man, I just can't get enough of these mock drafts. Reg, I think you misunderstood. I, I think it was, <laughs> Lost I in translation? I Something got lost there. It. I can't take it any longer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, Reggie, to your delight, we have plenty of draft questions to get to. But why, why don't we start with this? Um, this is not draft related. This is Dalvin Cook related. Um, Luke and I talked about it on yesterday's show, how uh, there was a report on Dalvin Cook's health, that his shoulder's doing better. It's not going to get dislocated again and that he's going to be good to go. And and we suspect that uh, that was maybe a, a ploy by either the team or the agent to try to you know pump up that trade value a little bit. But uh, here's the question from Nathan at Michigan Skull. The Vikings trade Dalvin for the Broncos. Sorry, Vikings trade Dalvin to the Broncos for Cortland Sutton or Tim Patrick. So a player for player trade, not a Dalvin for picks trade, a player for player trade. Uh, does that make any sense, Reggie, to give uh, Russell Wilson a little a little running game support in exchange for a passing game weapon? Maybe. Maybe like I think the the issue is they've been long rumored to be wanting to move on from Tim Patrick and or not Tim Patrick but Cortland Sutton yeah and it's like well uh, not really sure why you know Russ needs the weapons but maybe Sean Payton is like look Russ is maybe not the guy that he used to be if he gets some um, run support then maybe it'll help him be a little bit better. Uh, this season and help that offense be a little bit more balanced, maybe find a little bit more success. Look, I know, Sam, I know you're down on Dalvin, but I still think he is a really good back and and has a lot of good football left in him. And so, but I understand the Vikings dilemma because people just aren't paying running backs what Cook is getting paid right now anymore. And it's tough to see just the, because of the use that the running backs get, it's tough to see that, that their market is just not what it is. Like Zeke got cut. He hasn't found a new team yet. But the Cowboys weren't willing to pay him as much as as he was uh, scheduled to get paid. But they franchise tag Tony Pollard. And so it, it's really interesting, you know, this situation with Dalvin Cook. You still don't really know what exactly the Vikings' plans are. I still think it's fluid. I still think they're trying to figure out what their plans are. And but but that trade kind of makes sense. You know, it it gives Cousins another weapon, but it it also finds a new landing spot for a player who may have 
I don't know. I, I wouldn't say he's worn out his welcome in Minnesota, but maybe just this this new regime just thinks that they could they can do a little bit different than than feeding Dalvin. You know, Mike Zimmer would never. That was his that was his guy. But yep. this this new regime is just a little bit different. So, you know, they they gave a little bit of money to Alexander Madison. Maybe he becomes like the feature back, or maybe he becomes just like a one-two punch with either someone they're going to draft, someone they're going to sign, or one of the guys that they already have, um, something like that. But I think the trade could make sense. Right now, the running back market is so watered down. Like you said, there's big names like Zeke Elliott still sitting out there. The Vikings cap, on the other hand, it's as tight as it can get. Dead last cap in the league as it stands here today. They don't even have enough money to go sign their own draft picks right now. So something needs to be done about Dalvin Cook. He will be moved, in my opinion, one way or another. If you can find a player-for-player player trade like this Cortland Sutton swap, I think it makes a ton of sense. Then it allows Quasey to go into the draft with a little bit more BPA, best player available mindset, and not so much need on, oh, we got to get a wide receiver here. I like it on paper. It makes a ton of sense. Would the Broncos do that? I'm not entirely sure. I know they still have a lot of high hopes and expectations for Javante Williams coming off an injury. They signed some AJP Ryan, who I think is one of the better backup running backs in the entire league. Loved what he did over there in Cincinnati for the last few years. So I'm not sure Denver signs off on this, but one way or another, I think Dalvin Cook is going to get moved. Maybe it's on draft weekend, but they have to clear that cap space one way or another. So it's going to be interesting. I still think Miami makes the most sense on paper. He's from Miami. Mike McDaniel's building a track team over there. How crazy would it be to see Tyree Kill, Jalen Waddle, guys like that with Delvin Cook in the backfield? That would be scary. Teams like the Chargers, maybe. Austin Eckler seems to be on the block. The Buffalo Bills have always been looking for it. Seems like the last four or five years to find that true number number one running back, a lot of options. But at the end of the day for the Vikings, feels like their back's kind of against the wall and they don't have a ton of leverage because teams know they got to clear this cap space and get Dalvin Cook off the books. Yeah, I uh, I looked at the cap hits for Sutton, 18 million. For Patrick, it's 11 million. So it's not as if this would represent tremendous savings for the Vikings, which is one of the, the goals here. Um, I love adding pass catchers. But I'm not also not sure the Vikings are in the position to add expensive pass catchers to this roster when they have the Justin Jefferson contract coming. And just bringing in someone like Sutton, I think, would be overpaid and underutilized with a Justin Jefferson on the team. Like, I think you've also got KJ Osborne and TJ Hawkinson to feed, and you'd be adding more money to your book. So I'm not sure that that makes a ton of sense. Um, I might yeah, actually be. I'm, I'm with you. I think in a player yeah. for player swap like this, Sam, I think you're right. Like, I think both guys have to assume a new contract is in the works or has to be done. Just looking at Cortland Sutton, I loved him coming out of SMU, by the way, top 40 pick. Kind of just jumped out right on the scene those first two years. But then in 2020, he gets hurt, doesn't play more than one game. And then the last two years, it seems like he kind of still trying to find that momentum again. So 18 mil for the production that he's put up just the last three years, I would think he would expect him and his agent some sort of new contract has to be in the works there too, along with Dalvin as well. Whatever team trades for Dalvin, I would assume will have a new contract ready and just kind of reset the book and the market for him as well. All right, I'm going to ask Luke Inman if the Vikings could take a safety in the first round after I remind you that this uh, show is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. It's America's number one sportsbook, and it's a great app to download as the NBA playoffs and NHL playoffs approach. New customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000 back in bonus bets if the first bet doesn't win. Download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. Safe, secure, easy to use. Bet on everything you can imagine, every line, every sport, every league. It's unbelievable how many options they have. And also those same game parlays, very fun. Stack bets within the same game for a chance at huge payouts. And get your no-sweat first bet if you're a new customer. Up to $1,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win at FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more. All righty. This is a Luke Inman question from Up For Discussion on Twitter. All right, fellas, Brian Branch is there at 23. He's the guy, right? Byron Murphy can play press man corner. Branch can be our day one nickel, as I doubt Sullivan is coming back. Then we really only need one 
of Booth or Evans to step up. So Brian Branch, technically a safety, Luke Ginman, and he suggests he could play play kind of a big nickel role. That'd be two safeties in a row in the first round. Well, first of all, just take a step back. Brian Branch, the prospect, I absolutely love the guy. Probably going to end up in my top 10 on the final big board. Maybe not the tools of like, think back to like Kyle Hamilton last draft or like a Jamal Adams coming out from LSU in top 10. But when you just look at the production, when you just look at the tape, the guy just screams NFL player. Maybe the best tackler in the entire draft class, his entire collegiate career playing in the SEC at Alabama, facing some of the best running backs and offensive weapons in the entire country. He missed four tackles in four years, his entire collegiate career. So absolutely outstanding tackler. And he is, like you mentioned, Sam, an elite slot cornerback. So, I mean, checks all the boxes as far as just, all right, Quasey, go into this draft with the BPA mindset. Just draft good football players. Brian Branch is definitely that guy. Now, they signed Byron Murphy, right, to be the outside corner in the base defense. But in the nickel, he's going to slide inside to that slot cornerback. So now you're kind of doubling up there. You can certainly just leave Byron Murphy on the outside. I just don't know how much that kind of, I don't want to say ruins their plans. It's a great problem to have, to have two slot inside cornerbacks. But I just think that it may be doubling up, so to speak, a little bit on both these guys' strengths when you talk about what do they do best, Byron Murphy and Brian Branch, when you get in that nickel? They both play the slot very well. So it's a great problem to have. I love Brian Branch, the prospect. If he was there at 23, I would be very tempted and, in fact, very excited if they did draft him. But when you also look at the fact that they drafted another safety last year in Lewis Seen, now you start to wonder, is there too many cooks in the kitchen? Can't have enough good cornerbacks in this past happy league. I just wonder, as you try to get in the, the mind and the shoes of Quasi and Brian Flores and people like that, if they prefer somebody who's a little bit more natural as a boundary cornerback on the outside knowing again the plan all along once they signed Byron Murphy was to slide him side to nickel so he may be long gone Sam he may be Mm -hmm. you know in those first 10-15 picks he's that good you feel as strongly about him as you did Hamilton yeah I I feel like Hamilton's got the higher ceiling I feel like he's more of a ball hawk too he's he's a guy that's gonna be a big play machine for the Ravens he started out really slow a lot of people knocked him called him a bust the first four or five weeks you look at the second half of the season Kyle Hamilton looked the part of the number one safety of the draft class looked the part of a top 20 pick Brian Branch is again more of that in the box safety not as much of a ball hawk still top 10 in pass deflections who's the guys who can get their hands on the ball that usually equates and translates very well to the next level but Brian Branch similar to Lewis Seen right both in the box safeties Branch is going to be more of your nickel cornerback as well but again does a lot of the things well that you're going to need in the NFL first and foremost he tackles well which we know Brian Flores that's what he looks for first and foremost can these guys tackle Brian Branch can do that for sure yeah Reg any thoughts on Branch and kind of more broadly are there limits to what you would do with this pick from a BPA perspective because I think we all like to talk best player available but when push comes to shove yeah drafting another safety does you know kind of seem a little weird like drafting Bijan Robinson would be nice but it seems a little weird like there are certain positions I think that even if there's talent it doesn't feel right for this team yeah, it was interesting, too, because last year, uh, I don't think anybody really had Lewis Seen on their radar for the Vikings to take. And then they they took him and it was just like, oh, OK, all right, maybe we can see the vision here. And so Branch would be probably another one of those guys that you're just like, OK, fine. <laughs> but um, Luke, do you think Joey Porter Jr. will be there uh, when they pick? You know, Reg, I would love to say yes. I really would. He's a draft crush of not only mine, but a lot of people's out there. Sounds like probably yours as well. Love the NFL genes. Love the feistiness, the swag that he plays with. I want my cornerbacks to play with that confidence. And long, six foot, but long arms. One of the longer wingspans from any cornerback. You just know he's going to be good. I talked about Brian Branch being polished coming out. Mm -hmm. Joey Porter Jr. is about as polished as they come. I don't think he lasts this gauntlet 
of teams from about 10 to 22 that yeah. all could justify going cornerback. You know, you look at Washington at 14. Obviously, they could go cornerback for sure. Uh, Philadelphia, even as high as 10. New England, always in the market for cornerbacks for Bill Belichick. Pittsburgh at 17. How does he last any longer than Pittsburgh, knowing that Joey Porter, his father, played right. so many good years there for yeah. Mike Tomlin? So Detroit at 18, Tampa at 19, Seattle at 20. It's a gauntlet. And granted, yeah. there's a ton of good corners. Devon Witherspoon from Illinois, Christian Gonzalez. I'm worried about it's just a little shark infested waters there that Joey Porter Jr. makes it all the way to 23. That would be the dream scenario, though, for sure. So how about this? Would it be where they're picking? Would it be too high to take a guy like Julius Brents? Julius Brents is a guy that Sam and I were turned on to by a guy named Russell Brown, who was a big fan of the pod, came on the show about a month ago, turned us on to him right before the Senior Bowl, really fallen in love with him. The dude can ball, like, man. I feel like he's a guy, just because he's a little bit more unpolished compared to the Deontay Banks from Maryland, Tyreek Stevenson from Miami, some of those guys, I feel like if you're trying to play the value game, that's a guy that maybe you try to slide down seven, eight picks later in mm. the first round and then take a stab at. But he's certainly a guy, especially after you look at all the success of Tariq Woolen last year, same kind of body frame and play style, long, lanky, six foot three and a half. These guys just don't grow on trees. You don't want to get too cute because I feel like the league's not going to make that same mistake twice. They let Tyreek Woolen slip all the way to the fifth round. I think they look at Julius Brents the same kind of way yeah. and say, we got to take this guy probably in the top 50, 60 picks. So you can't get too cute. You trade down, I feel a lot more better about it, just getting a little bit more value. But certainly, I would wouldn't be surprised if he ended up going late round one. Right now, it seems like the discussion is more of a second, third round guy. Yeah, that guy's an alien, though. I mean, Julius is. Brent is oh unbelievable. Gosh. Yeah, yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. And it's not just he's tall and long. Look at the combine. Yeah. Jump through the roof. The yeah. broad was outstanding. 40 time in the four fives for that size and length. Again, almost like a Madden created player. These guys he's just like, don't grow on trees. He's like Richard Sherman 2.0 or yeah, something. Yeah, he really is, Reg. <laughs> Good call out. He really is. If not even a little faster, I think Richard Sherman, the only reason he dropped from Stanford to round four or five, I think it was, ran like a 4.63. Not a very fast 40 time. But again, you get these taller, longer corners, you're going to lean more into the physicality of them, the mm -hmm. press man technique and coverage at the top. One of those wild cards, it seems like, one of the more polarizing players in this draft class. Class. You tell somebody he could go third round, they go, yeah, that seems right, a little bit unrefined. You tell somebody he goes end of round one, nobody blinks an eye either. They go, I can see it. You know, his potential and ceiling is that good in the NFL. Comment below, which defensive back are you absolutely in love with? Let us know in the comment section. Is it Joey Porter Jr.? Is it Brian Branch? Is it Julius Brents? Let us know in the comment section on the YouTube channel. Um, how far is too far to trade back? We answer that after I talk about Built Bar. The Built March Madness has come to an end, sadly. That was fun. BuiltMarchMadness.com. People flocked there and voted for their favorite bars and puffs for a chance to win free boxes of Built and Built subscriptions. Why did people flock? Because Built is simply the best protein bar on Earth, um, probably in the galaxy. If there's other <laughs> life forms in this, in this universe... They probably don't have a protein bar that's as good as Built. That's how good Built is. Their bars and puffs have high protein, low sugar, uh, covered in 100% real chocolate, creative, numerous flavors, unbelievably made. I love Built bars. I give them my full endorsement, and hopefully you go to Built.com, order a box or two, and use the promo code LOCKEDON15 for 15% off. Built.com, great flavors, great protein bars. It's Built Bar. Um, also, check out the Luke Inman uh, newsletter, NFL Draft Buzz, LockedOnPodcast.com slash newsletters to subscribe. Luke Inman works hard on it. He knows his stuff, and you can get that straight to your inbox every week. How far is too far to trade back, asks Paul. I think we agree that there's still a good likelihood if the Vikings don't trade up, make a big splash for a quarterback, that trading down might be more realistic, Reggie. Reg, last year they went from... Uh, 12 to 32 um, in the first round. A lot of people thought that was a little bit too far of a dip. How far is too far to trade back this year? Out of the first round, like mm -hmm. if they just decide, you know what, we're just going to find value. We'll, we'll, we'll take two second round picks instead. 
then maybe that's a, a situation where you're just like, okay. I would tell you though, last year doing the news, it was like, okay, cool. You're coming up <laughs> 12. Okay. We'll be able to get some analysis on this pick. I'll be able to do a little research, get it ready for, because I had two hits. I had a, a hit in the, what they call the A block, which is the first like 10 minutes of the newscast. And then, come back and get me for sports, I have a little bit more. How about that? Maybe, you know, by that time we'll have heard from Kwesi and KOC and, you know, we'll have some sound to put on air as well, their reaction to the to the draft pick at 12. Surely it's going to be Jamison Williams, right? I mean, <laughs> Luke and I, I was banging the table on the podcast all yep. last year pre-draft for Jamison Williams. Surely. Wait, they traded with the Lions? Wait. Th- Wait, what? The Lions took Jamison Williams? Wait, they, they went back 20 picks? You know what was crazy about the whole thing last year was I was literally going on the air with my sports cast <laughs> as they were picking. Mm. <laughs> and I hadn't done a whole lot of research on Lewis Seen because, like, I hadn't seen him on really, like, the the draft boards, like, mock to the Vikings or anything. So I think I was on air. I called him Lewis Sine or something like that. Like, I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know. Like, I just didn't know. I hadn't I hadn't really heard of the guy, you know? That, that just tells you how, you know, much I am just locked into this draft, uh, Luke and Sam. But – I think what was interesting about that was like I'm I'm literally like hey hey uh, the Vikings just took Lewis and I uh, sending it back to you in the studio. They're like all right, <laughs> good night. We'll we'll hear more from the Vikings tomorrow. Like <laughs> so, hopefully, oh, man. hopefully they don't trade back any further than the second round because like that would just be the most anticlimactic thing that they could do with a guy who is hoping to have some info for the people. Some hot off the presses information for the people. Hopefully, the hot off the presses information isn't that they traded back into the second round because then it's like, well, uh, we'll we'll talk about what they do tomorrow, but they didn't do anything today. All those people doing live draft shows too, thinking that okay, uh, we got we got oh, to get up to pick twelve, and then then we're good. Then we can talk about the Vikings pick, and they had to tap dance for twenty more picks hmm. uh luke inman i think your team trade back like like you and i i think we we both believe that unless you are gonna make that big big move and go up and get your quarterback you're probably trading back you want to amass picks you only have five um so do you i know that you in your sleep like before you go to bed at night you're running the simulator you're running that pff simulator you're just trying to get it in your brain so they can process during the night um and when you do those sims, at what point is there a drop off in talent that you think would be kind of too far for the Vikings to go? Yeah, I think in most drafts, once you get past the blue chip, can't miss kind of guys, once you get past that first wave of quarterbacks, you get into that 15 to 20 range you start at all the way into the middle second round, top 50, top 55, it seems like in this draft. Most guys, depending on what team you're talking to, Guys kind of grayed out pretty similar. It's more a pick your flavor. It's more a go get your guy season. Who do you love for your scheme and your playbook? You know, what guys did you fall in love with during the pre-draft process? But there's not really a lot of guys that stick out so much at pick 23 versus pick 42. I mean, Sam, you talked about Josh Downs so much the last few weeks. Josh Downs could be a, a perfect candidate to go at pick 40, pick 45, somewhere in that range. Jack Campbell, we've talked about a lot. Trenton Simpson, tons of tight ends in here as well. Clark Phillips, I'm just looking at the top 50, 60 guys. Reggie just mentioned Julius Brents. You want to trade down in the second? Maybe get two seconds? By the way, a team like the New York Jets, they have back-to-back picks in the second round, 42 and 43. We already made a big trade with the Lions last year, so you know Quasey's willing to do it. They got picks 48 and 55. Just two potential candidates I'm flinging out there. The issue with last year that I had, I didn't mind that they traded down 20 spots. That's fine. But if you're going to do it, you got to get full value. And I felt like moving down that far should have definitely netted you at least a future second round pick, if not a future first round pick. I think you move down that far, especially picking so early in round one, 
most teams, just looking back throughout the last 5, 10, 15 years, they're going to get future picks. And a first-round pick was not out of the question. So to not get a, a future pick, even if it's just a second or a third-round pick, I felt like Quasey got a little slighted, felt like the chair was a little bit too big for him in his first draft. I'm going to give him a second chance here. I'm all for moving down. That's fine. It just has to feel good as far as the value goes. And there's different trade value charts mm -hmm. out there. But I think just in general, I think as long as you feel like you're getting good value, I'm all for it. Because at the end of the day, the draft, as much as we do all the research, watch the tape, read the mock drafts, write the big boards, it's a crapshoot, man. Go back and look at drafts from four, five, six years ago and look at how many guys aren't even in the league anymore that you thought, oh, this guy's going to be a sleeper. This guy's going to be a sure thing. So it's really a crapshoot. And I think at the end of the day, Sam, you want as many lottery tickets as you can buy. You want as many scratch offs as you can get. And that means trading back and just having more stabs, more darts to throw up on the board at the end of the day. So when you look back in three, four years, yeah. Just like every other team, we didn't hit on all our guys, but at least we had more picks to give us better chances at hitting on some guys. So doesn't always work that way, but in a perfect world, I think, again, there's a sweet spot around 40 to 55, even 60. You can get some really good prospects. We talked about John Michael Schmitz, the center from the Gophers a lot. Seems like another great candidate to get in a trade back in the middle of round two. So a lot of good mm -hmm. players still left to be had in that second round. I wouldn't go anything past about 60 ish though then there seems to be a drop off you're clearly getting into that second and third tier of prospects okay all right um we've entered the speed round portion of the mailbag show quick answers fellas uh we got some lighter questions how about this one from benjamin are the vikings ever going to do alternate uniforms or helmets like a lot of other franchises uh it's interesting because the vikings really have never strayed from purple purple and white sometimes purple on purple. Um, I've always thought that that a, a black alternate, all black, would be sick. Like, that would be really, really cool. And I feel like the league would want this. Like, think about the NBA. The NBA has this whole revenue stream with jersey sales because they have alternates. Every team is always mixing and matching logos, colors, and they can sell that stuff. They can brand it. And I, I think in the NFL, you... Buy a jersey because of the name on the back, not necessarily because of, oh, this is a cool jersey. Um, you love the player that you're representing. I think the NFL could actually do better in that regard and kind of being a little more creative with their jerseys. Vikings going all black. That would be sick. Yeah, I would, I would absolutely love it. You're right. Vikings, uh, compared to a lot of other teams, like I hate the Eagles. I'm not afraid to say it. Yeah, boom, I said it. I don't like the Eagles. They got one of the best retro alternate jerseys out there, and the Packers got some cool ones, Steelers, everybody else. Patriots are pretty cool. Feels like the Vikings got to get with the times a little bit. I did love when they had Brett Favre. I think it was for the Green Bay Packer game at home. Those old school retro jerseys that they busted out. Those would be cool. But yeah, I'm with you, Sam. Color outside the lines a little bit. Let's get crazy. All black alternate unis would be outstanding. It's the same two or three jerseys every single season. Yeah. Reg? I just think I think the the Vikings uniforms are just smooth. You know, like I. Mm -hmm. um, it was interesting when I was in Cincinnati and the Bengals decided to change their jerseys up. And I was just like, there was nothing wrong with the ones that they had. Like that, I thought, I thought that the Bengals had one of the better looking jerseys uh, in all the, all of the NFL. And so the Vikings the same way, like when they came out for that white out, man, that was some, that was some slick looking, looking, you know, garb right there. Um, that being said, the black would be cool. Just don't get too out there, I think, because uh, I was talking to one of my, my guys. He's a big Phoenix Suns fan. The Suns have this alternate jersey now that's like aqua. And I was just like, they're giving me Phoenix Thunder vibes. Like, it's not it's not <laughs> like, you know, like, are they the, the OKC tropics. Suns? You know, like, yeah. what what's going on? So, like, don't get too far out there. But But black is cool, I think. The Cardinals introduced black to their uniforms, and that was a that was a different kind of look. But black and purple, you know, as a Lakers fan, it could work. I think it could yeah. work. I I don't really like when teams literally change their color scheme. Like the Milwaukee Bucks, for instance, went from mainly purple to kind of like the awesome forest green and kind of a maroon. Um, but then occasionally they'll wear the purple throwbacks, and it's just confusing to me. It's like, wait, you're purple now? You were just green. Um so that I think 
I wouldn't go too far away from purple, certainly. Um, this just came in. Luke, give me 20 seconds on the Vikings trade back to the last pick of the first round and draft Malik Cunningham. Who's Malik uh, Cunningham? Uh, Malik Cunningham, Louisville. Big-bodied guy. Got some mobility as well. This may be just a go-get-your-guy. This is his draft crush because late first round seems awfully high. I would be looking at guys like Max Duggan or Stenson Bennett. Dorian Thompson Robinson gets thrown out there a lot. Jaron Hall from BYU. Tanner McKee, all before I'm looking at Malik Cunningham. Didn't have a great senior bowl. He's got some good tape for your starter, but uh, late first round. I mean, I get it. I want to draft my quarterback in round one just for the fifth-year option so I get that fifth year to pay him a rookie deal, but seems extremely high. I haven't seen him floated out that high all pre-draft process. More of a day three developmental project guy like some of the other names I flung out there. So seems a little rich for my blood, but hey, mm -hmm. go get your guys if that's your guy. Have at it. Make Reggie wait till the 32nd pick again on <laughs> yeah, the newscast. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, Mer Mer uh, go ahead, Reg. Do you have something? No, I was just going to say, yeah, I, I hadn't seen Malik Cunningham in like the top five or even top ten of, of people's like QBs. Like that dude must really just he, – he's watched That's a lot of Louisville. Crush. That's yeah, his guy. watched a lot of Louisville football. It's just like, I like this dude. I mean, look, he's a very athletic quarterback, kind of – you know, put put Louisville kind of in the mind of, you know, going back to like a, a Lamar Jackson, but not like as dynamic as him. But what's interesting is he's 24 years old. We talked about Hendon Hooker being 25. Like he's an older uh, quarterback draft prospect as well. So not really like the, you know, 24 is not old, but, you know, he's not like the c conventional guy that's, you know, 20, 21, 22 years old coming out of the draft. Mm -hmm. Maurice and Paul, I see your questions. We'll get to those on a future show. That's it for today's Mailbag Edition. He's Luke Inman, the draft guru, NFL draft buzz author. He's at Luke underscore Spinman on Twitter. Reggie Wilson, see him on Care 11 at Reggie Wilson TV on Twitter. And I'm Sam Ekstrom. Find me at Sam Ekstrom on Twitter. Tomorrow, Luke Braun rejoins the football party. As we continue on with our pre-draft coverage, how many days, Luke? 22? 22 that the, days, that's paper fellas. That's right. All right. Good stuff. Uh, for Reggie, Luke, I'm Sam. So long on the Minnesota Football Party.